in the last talk, we looked at some of the problems in schools um, that are of particular concern to Christian parents. Um, and in this talk, we're going to look at what parents can actually do when up against some of those problems. And we'll also consider how Christian teachers can handle teaching about controversial topics. Now, parents and teachers alike are called by God to have a role in the education of children. God has given parents special authority and responsibility for the raising and education of their own children. They are the primary educators. And this position is recognised not only in scripture, but also in law. But teachers also play an important role, helping children uncover the truth about God's creation to develop their God-given gifts and abilities and guiding them morally to learn how to interact with others. And of course, some teachers are parents too. So let's start by looking at the relationship between parents and schools. Schools provide education on behalf of parents. Parents may choose to delegate some of their responsibility in education to schools, but parents remain primary educators. And this puts parents in the very best place to challenge schools that are promoting ideologies that are in opposition to what they believe to be true. But we need to be careful to approach disagreements with humility. And I think we also need to avoid thinking of teachers as the enemy. For schools to work, there has to be an element of trust. There has to be an ability to work together for the good of the child. So we want to encourage and empower parents to build constructive partnerships with schools, a partnership where their views are heard and taken seriously. And it's helpful to start by building a positive relationship with the school. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. <coughs> in the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. In this passage, Jesus chooses to define the identity of his disciples in the world as salt and light. And the verses preceding these describe the characteristics of Christian disciples. Poor in spirit, meek, merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers. Being salt and light is an outward expression of who we are by God's grace. In Christ and living this way has its effects salt both preserves and adds flavor and light illuminates the way for others and each of us has to bring that saltiness and that light to our particular context parents teachers and churches alike need to bring that to the schools they're involved in for teachers being salt and light in schools will involve performing the duties of their jobs diligently as for the Lord. It will mean being fair, being patient, hoping and persevering for pupils, respecting each one of them. And it will also entail the sobering responsibility of not leading children into sin, as Jesus warns in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6. And the solemnity of this duty means Christian teachers want to teach in good conscience. And later on, we'll look at some ways teachers can navigate teaching about moral issues. Parents 
can be salt and light in schools in a number of ways, some as simple as having conversations in the playground, getting to know teachers and expressing some appreciation for what they do. They can demonstrate the fruit of the spirit in everyday interactions. But beyond this, parents can get involved in volunteering at the school. Many primary schools will be very keen for a parent to come in to work with small groups of children reading or to help on school trips. And they can also get involved in a parent-teacher association or maybe set one up if there isn't one already. And there's also the crucial role of parent governor for parents who want to be involved in school policy and decision making, including RSE policy. And this kind of positive, helpful engagement from Christian parents means they're better placed if they do need to voice concerns about a certain issue. The relationship with the school is not merely one of reacting to problems, but of building something positive. But positive engagement with schools should not simply be a means to an end. Engagement in schools needs to be motivated by a genuine desire to serve God and others in that context. Being a distinctive Christian witness means there may be times when parents' views diverge from contemporary culture and where they do need to challenge. Salt that loses its saltiness is no good except to be trodden underfoot. And that may sometimes generate some hostility. But let's be really sure that the cause of that hostility is a rejection of the gospel and the lordship of Jesus Christ, and not because we have been needlessly offensive in our conduct or in the way that we communicate our beliefs. So now we're going to look at some resources that parents can draw upon as they seek to do this. And much of the information we're going to look at is legislation, but we need to state that neither John nor I are lawyers. And most of the information that follows you'll find in the booklets, uh, the RSC guide and Equipped for Equality, and I'll refer to them as we go through. Education law and guidance upholds the role of parents as the primary educators of their children. They must provide education, but it's their choice whether to do so by sending their children to school or by some other means. And even if choosing to send their, their children to a state school, Section 9 of the Education Act 1996 states that in exercising or performing all their respective powers and duties, state schools must provide education in accordance with the wishes of parents. In fact, this has always been a core principle in our state education system. State education only got off the ground in the 19th century through careful legislation designed to safeguard the variety of conscientious positions on religious questions held by different parents and teachers. So schools have to have regard to parents' views. And this doesn't mean that everything the school teaches has to be what each individual parent wants. That simply wouldn't be manageable. But to ensure that education does meet this requirement, the courts have ruled that schools must fairly present different viewpoints in a balanced way and teach children and pupils to evaluate arguments, not just accept things uncritically. And this applies wherever there is controversy in wider society and especially where there's a difference of opinion between parents in the school community. Not to do this would simply be indoctrination. If schools only acknowledge one side of a debate in their teaching, it is likely to undermine the views of those parents who take the opposite view. And you can read more about that in section three of Equip for Equality, starting on page 16. The place of parents must be respected by schools in the care that they provide for children as well. Safeguarding guidance states, 
the welfare of children is paramount and they are best looked after within their families with their parents playing a full part in their lives. So if a child is seeking to live in the opposite gender at school, the school must involve parents in that decision. And these parental rights are good news for Christian teachers. They mean that if teachers are asked to teach from a lesson plan or a resource that presents secular ideology in a one-sided way, they have a valid reason to teach it in a better way that doesn't violate their conscience. So take, for example, a teacher um, who was required to use the gender-bred person in class. Now, it might be possible for them to persuade senior leaders that it shouldn't be taught at all. But if that is out of the question, at the very least, the teacher is at liberty to present that view of gender as one among many, asking pupils questions to help them compare the different views and consider the arguments critically. Of course, teachers will need to be very careful to facilitate discussions that are respectful and where no pupil feels compelled to share their views if they would rather keep them private. And te teachers, particularly in state-funded schools, are protected by the legal doctrine of compelled speech as established by the Ashes case. And this means that schools must not force teachers to express a view that they fundamentally disagree with. Teachers sometimes have questions about whether they're allowed to share their beliefs with pupils. Now this is a wisdom call that teachers, teachers will need to make depending on the school where they work. But Department for Education guidance on the Equality Act in schools states that no school or individual teacher is under a duty to support, promote or endorse marriage of same-sex couples. Teaching should be based on facts and should enable pupils to develop an understanding of how the law applies to different relationships. And where individual teachers are concerned, having a view about something does not amount to discrimination. So it should not be unlawful for a teacher in any school to express personal views on sexual orientation provided that it is done in an appropriate manner and context. For example, when responding to questions from pupils or in an RE or personal social health and economic education PSHE lesson. Although this guidance is talking about sexual orientation and same-sex marriage, the principle should apply to other issues of controversy. Now, where those issues are political <coughs> issues, <coughs> Guidance on political impartiality states that, as a general principle, teachers should avoid expressing their own personal political views to pupils unless they are confident this will not amount to promoting that view to pupils. Where staff do share their personal political views, they should ensure that this is not presented as fact and note that there are opposing views which pupils may wish to consider. But returning now to parents, there's also a right of withdrawal from some subjects that touch upon areas of deeply held conscientious belief. And most relevant to us today is the right of withdrawal from sex education. But this right also applies to religious education and collective worship and it provides a fundamental backstop protection for parents to ensure that their religious or philosophical convictions are not undermined by teaching in these areas. A lot of parents would prefer not to have to use the right to withdraw, and they may prefer their own and other children to receive education that is appropriate and acknowledges a diversity of opinion and religious belief. But as I mentioned in the last session, the right to withdraw does not apply to relationships education and some of the most controversial topics occur in that subject. But there are special legal safeguards specifically for RSE which help to protect parents' rights. 
So most notably, RSC must be appropriate having regard to the age and religious background of the pupils. That's section 80A of the Education Act 2002. All schools are required to have an RSE policy in place and they are legally required to consult with parents before making or revising that policy. That's section 80B of the Education Act 2002. So, the law requires schools to ensure that all teaching is age appropriate and this means that schools mustn't use graphic or titillating images for teaching sex education, for example. In secondary schools, when teaching young people about internet safety and the risk of online content, including pornography, schools mustn't expose pupils to unnecessary details of harmful content. Similarly, in primary schools, complex contentious issues should not be presented at an age when children are not yet able to engage with the content critically. So consideration of age appropriateness should apply to complex ideas relating to sexuality and identity as well. An RSE must also be appropriate to pupils' religious backgrounds. This means that schools have to consider pupils' religious backgrounds when planning and teaching. And RSE teaching mustn't undermine pupils' religious beliefs. Again, that's to ensure that families' conscientious beliefs are respected. And schools can include religious viewpoints in their teaching. Government guidance on RSE states all schools may teach about faith perspectives. This is not restricted to schools with a religious character. Other major religions have much in common with Christianity in their ethical beliefs about marriage, homosexuality or transgenderism. Schools that do have a religious character often have further requirements to teach in accordance with the tenets of that religion and you can read more about that in section 6 of the RSE guide. Now, some schools may claim that it's inappropriate to include a Christian perspective because not all pupils are Christians and many disagree with Christian teaching. It can be helpful to explain to schools that including religious perspectives is permitted and that mentioning different viewpoints is not the same as promoting those viewpoints. To exclude religious views entirely would be to promote a secular viewpoint and that would not be appropriate for pupils who have different religious backgrounds. One area where schools will find it very easy to include a religious view is on the topic of marriage. By law, pupils must learn the nature of marriage and civil partnership and their importance for family life and the bringing up of children, that's section 80A of the Education Act 2002. Of course, legal marriage in the UK now includes same-sex marriage, but it's still the case that teaching on marriage provides a clear opportunity to include a Christian view. And schools can and should include the evidence base for marriage over cohabitation. Children of married couples are three times more likely to still be living with both parents on their fifth birthday than children of cohabitees. In turn, children brought up in stable homes tend to experience better outcomes at school and in future employment and are less likely to be involved in the criminal justice system. Young people need to be told this information Otherwise, schools are denying them key knowledge about some of the most important decisions they're going to make in their lives. Parents are in a position to stand for factual teaching on marriage to be included in the RSE curriculum through parental consultation. As I mentioned, consulting with parents is a legal requirement for RSE and the COVID-19 pandemic didn't change that. In fact, Throughout the pandemic, the government reminded schools repeatedly that they had to carry out consultation with parents before beginning teaching. 
Schools should also revise their RSE policy regularly, and when they do, parents need to be consulted again. Christian parents will want to take part in the consultation process because this is a key mechanism for the school to find out about their pupils' religious backgrounds in order to then provide education that is appropriate. Consultation doesn't give parents a right of veto over curriculum content, but it is a chance to express their beliefs or concerns about certain topics and to engage with schools to ensure that the necessary safeguards are in place so that pupils are not exposed to inappropriate content. And the consultation process should have a demonstrable effect on the formation of the school's RSE policy and the development of their programme. And you can read more about what the law says about RSE and the content of the government guidance in the RSE guide. The Department for Education released further guidance in September 2020 to provide even more clarity for schools concerning their delivery of RSE. And one thing this guidance did was remind schools of their duties to political impartiality. The guidance states that schools must forbid the promotion of partisan political views in the teaching of any subject in the school and take reasonably practicable steps to secure that where political issues are brought to the attention of pupils, they are offered a balanced presentation of opposing views. And the guidance very helpfully clarifies that partisan political views aren't only about party politics, but apply to a range of issues, including equalities issues. This guidance can be used to guard against schools exploring political equalities issues such as same-sex marriage or gender self-identification exclusively from one perspective of the debate. This will be useful for securing balance in RSE, but it's also useful in relation to Pride events or weeks which often promote LGBT rights causes. And schools have to be politically balanced in their overall approach and ensure that that balance spans the breadth of the curriculum. The guidance also cautions schools about which external organisations they should and shouldn't work with. It doesn't mention any organisations by name, but it says... Schools should not, under any circumstances, use resources produced by organisations that take extreme political positions on matters. And these extreme political positions are outlined in separate guidance on political impartiality, and they include a publicly stated desire to abolish democracy, to end free and fair elections, or violently overthrow capitalism, Opposition to the right of freedom of speech and freedom of religion and conscience. And the use or endorsement of racist language or communications, including anti-Semitic. There are similar cautions about working with external organisations when it comes to delivering transgender content. RSE guidance states, you should not reinforce harmful stereotypes for instance, by suggesting that children might be a different gender based on their personality and interests or the clothes they prefer to wear. Materials which suggest that non-conformity to gender stereotypes should be seen as synonymous with having a different gender identity should not be used and you should not work with external agencies or organisations that produce such material. Again, the guidance doesn't mention any organisations by name, but this should rule out some of the resources we looked at in the previous session. And all of this means that schools need to thoroughly vet any external organisations they work with or whose materials they use. Schools should not work with agencies or use materials if doing so would hamper their abilities to fulfil their legal duties. And there's more information about the content of this guidance in the supplement to the RSE guide, which should be inserted in the booklets. Where parents believe schools are not 
upholding their statutory duties regarding any of these requirements or really for any other reason, they can make a complaint to the school. All schools must have a complaints procedure and parents can follow the process outlined in that document should they need to complain. I appreciate there's been a lot of information again in this session. Um, Equipped for Equality and the RSE guidance supplement will consolidate a lot of what I've just said. I want to hope really that some of the things that I've shared have been an encouragement actually. Parents really do have opportunities to engage with schools and they really do have a voice. And there are useful provisions in law and guidance that can help to support their case uh, should they need to make a complaint and they are also helpful for Christian teachers. This doesn't make the uh, process of engaging with schools easy or stress-free, but certainly building a friendly, constructive relationship with the school is a good place to start. Now, in the next talk, John is going to develop this further and consider the ways that churches can be involved in positive partnerships with schools, keeping that salt and light in education. For more great content, like, subscribe and hit the notification bell.